hello, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary in Westboro. Uh, with me is my good friend Shelby Marshall, Hi, as you know, my co-host, and the purpose of this show is to be talking about um, things that you ought to know about, things that Frank and Mary ought to know about if they're living here in Westboro, things that you ought to know about and people you ought to know about if you're a senior living here in town. One of the people that Shelby suggested you really ought to know about here in town is my old friend Danielle Gregoire, uh, who is who is your state rep, but also is from my hometown. So, but with that, I'll have Shelby um, go from there. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for making time out of what is a currently busy schedule, given the time of year. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, first, let's you know give our viewers a chance to get to know you. So, who are you? Okay. Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Um, okay, great. So, I am Danielle Gregoire. I've served precincts one and three here in the town of Westboro, along with two precincts in the town of Northboro and 10 precincts in our home city, Arthur, of North of Marlboro. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Marlboro. I'm in the fifth generation of my family to live there on my mother's side. Um, we all went to the Marlboro Public Schools, and I'm just really proud of our city and what we've been doing and have gotten to know Northboro and Westboro over the last couple of years. I served as a legislative aide to the state rep who served prior to me. His name was Steve LaDuke for five or six years, six or seven, while I was going to law school in the evenings. Uh, I did end up graduating from law school and passing the bar exam, and the timing worked out so that I ended up running for that seat way back 10 years ago in 2008. The right, right when Steve left. That's right, and the makeup of the district was a oh, little you were different. you like 17. Yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, because yeah. I'm, adding up, these, I'm yeah. adding up these years, and I'm saying, so the, this this yeah. very young, doesn't right. she look so young? I'm yeah. aging you know? in reverse. And this, like is like, this is like 18 years she's been like, involved show. in politics. That's a different show, Aging in Reverse. Aging in Reverse. Right. That's, right. Danielle. That's right, we'll do this. Um, so. It's a sequel to Reverse we, Mortgages, yeah. Reverse Aging. <laughs> we, you know, I jumped right into the race, and here we are 10 years later, and uh, this session, I was appointed by the Speaker of the House to serve as the Chair of the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs, which is why we're here to talk to you folks. Um, and, you know, it's been an unbelievable journey in between getting to know all the residents of the communities that I've represented outside of Marlboro, because I consider myself to be a little bit of an expert about Marlboro. But I've learned a lot in the last year and a half on aging and elder affairs. I wasn't even on the committee prior to being appointed its chair. Um, so I remember seeing you when you were just, it was like you were a weekend. You were mm -hmm. like, we got so many things to do. And you had people coming in to it try was, to brief you. It was a learning stuff. curve, yeah. and we yeah. got briefed by everyone. And I think it ended up working out really well, and we got some unbelievable things done uh, this session, which we'll talk about yeah. as the show goes on. So, so you know, government can be sort of overwhelming unless you're sort of a junkie and you love mm -hmm. to kind of follow that. Tell us about what that office is. What What is the purpose of the Office of Executive? Affairs. So we're the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs, yep. but we do work with right. the Executive Office, which is the administration. And as some people in town probably know, the Secretary of Elder Affairs, Alice Bonner, actually is a Westboro resident. So uh, the town of Westboro was very well served by its Elder Affairs uh, faction, I suppose, if you will. And um, we work hand in hand with them. So any of the legislation that we were considering moving forward, we would reach out to them and see. Okay or the Department of Public Health, whoever it was, okay, so usually in conjunction with okay. both. But we worked hand in hand with the administration on anything and everything that we did this year. Okay. Um, so it was a really great working relationship and I've never really met anyone like Secretary Bonner. She has the most energy and the yes. most passion and drive for what she does and, and it has been really great to get to know her and work with her. It's yeah. great to have a secretary who's just totally been in the trenches mm -hmm. and, then have a, and then have a mother you know, who is still alive, that she's mm -hmm. still a caregiver, so it just changes the whole way Absolutely. that people approach yeah. things. No, she really understands. She's, she's <laughs> one of the most incredible people I've ever worked yeah. with, really. It's been an honor. So tell us about, you know, sort of what that year of experience has been serving as chair and some of the results. So you? at the beginning it was, you know, just brass tacks. What are the bills that have been assigned to our committee? Because by the time we got our assignments, the bills had already been placed there. I was what lucky. Do they, what do they say? What do they I was lucky. <laughs> what do they say? What do they do? Who's this agency? Who's this activist group? I was very lucky as a first-time chair that it was a small amount of bills, like what's a comparably. Small, so we were somewhere sense? in the neighborhood of 80, wow. whereas, say, like the Committee on the Judiciary would have six or 700. Wow. Um, wow. So it was, it was a nice starter committee right. i like to call that, it for right. me and that again for for our audience that's to consider in what period of time so 80 starting f so across a year technically it goes through the what we call the joint rule 10 deadline which is when all of the bills have to have had some sort of action taken on them and this year that was 
this session, it was the second year of the session in March. Wow. Now, of course, you can Because the ex session is just the two years that you're elected two, for. That's right. And we just had an election, so that means that, ses that the session ends, right? This so like in December, our right? session is constitutionally mandated to have completed action on any bill that may be considered controversial by July 31st in the second year of the session. Wow. wow. I see. So that you, so that, but, but at least you became chair. Like that was last year. Yes, so you, and it was in February. So, so we you had got a full all the year and a half to right. to kind of get our feet wet. And I was very happy with the outcome on most of the things. There were a couple things we weren't able to get over the finish line, but as people know, sometimes these sweeping legislative yeah. policies take some time. So Absolutely. I have right. a good feeling that we'll be in a good place starting next session. So tell us about some of the results you're most pleased with. So obviously I'm or really even the ones you hate. You know, you can tell us about. <laughs> I, I, I will talk. This is no, a happy love show. We don't. <laughs> not, no, we is, want you know, serious. You know, I will oh, talk about running, it. She's you can attack her here. office again. You, can, you know, yeah. Well, that's right. We had a couple of failures oh, where we that, just we wrong. had a couple of failures where we just ran out of time. Yeah. And they're bills that I think are vitally important, and I do yeah. think we'll get a running start with them in January. Because you'll need to refile them and then it starts again. That's right. So one was a bill filed by my colleague from Worcester, Jim O'Day, to start a building fund for senior centers. And it was oh. just without examining a revenue source or anything yeah. like that. So we changed the wording of it to do a commission, a six-month commission, to mm -hmm. study what it would look like to create something like the School Building Authority for senior centers. So that you could provide matching or so something. So it would yeah, have yeah. been that, that commission that would have been tasked with finding a revenue stream and, mm -hmm. you know, coming up with potential rules and regulations by which that group would operate. So, Because one of the things I've, I've come to learn from doing some stuff in some other states is that we are one of the only states where you've got separate um, councils on aging in each community. Most states don't have that. Everything, all this stuff is all run regionally. Okay, yeah. And so it's much less friendly to seniors sure, sure. You know, as a result. Right. So that was one of the bills, and I do think, I, like I said, that has some legs. We just didn't have time because yeah, we were sure. considering so many overwhelming bills at the end of the session. Um, a second piece that I worked on a lot that I would really like to see come to fruition has to do with assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. So currently, if you reside in an assisted living facility and they have a nurse on staff, that nurse is not allowed to provide you any medical oh, care whatsoever. Right. right. Even though they are required to keep yes. up their licensing yep. and keep up all of their, they're still a registered nurse, they are not allowed under the current bylaws because like with the senior center building, Massachusetts is unique in that we re regulate our assisted living facilities under the Executive Office of Elder Affairs rather than the Department of Public Health, which right. oversees nursing homes. Sure. sure. So we had a bill that would have allowed those nurses to provide basic medical services, mm -hmm. wound care, injections, mm -hmm. and eye drops. Which, you know, you know, sort of having that experience, yeah. um, most families, when they go in and they're looking for care for their loved one, they think, oh, this is the place. And mm -hmm. and even if they hear it from the assisted living executive director, or the clinical director, or what have you, even if they say, understand, we can't do X, Y, and Z, right. they still think this is the, that. they're not hearing it, you know, because no. they're in such a- Because they see the nurse. Absolutely. And it, and it's and it's a shock. Like, so I had mean? a colleague from the Berkshires who was paying five times a day, $90 a visit oh. for a visiting nurse to come give his father insulin. And oh. it's not necessarily because the patient can't mentally handle no. it. It's because physically. they can't physically yep. load the, and the nurse can't even prepare the injection. Right. So okay. basic health services was one thing, and we negotiated it until the cows came home, and we were just there at the end, and again, it got lost in the oh. shuffle of all the other bills that were being yeah. negotiated. Yeah. Yeah. So it's something that I think it's really important in moving forward. It's something sure. I'm going to advocate for. Absolutely. Yeah, just stepping back to the just for a second, so who, did anyone oppose it, or was so, just one of those things that you just kind of ran out of So time? interestingly, there were assisted living owners that opposed it. That opposed it. Even though they were members of the Assisted Living Association. Mm -hmm. And depending on where we were with the wording about the requirement for the nurses, at times we had the nurses on board and at times we mm -hmm. didn't. Sure. So, um, we, you know, it was a constant yeah, fluid yeah, motion. Fluid, I was just going to say. And a yeah. constant back and forth. Mm -hmm. yep. um, but I think we'll be able to get there eventually yep. because yep. it seems it's called the common sense health care bill and it seems to be so right. common sense right. Right. that you have a nurse there and you should just let them do their job. Right. Well, because so. you really, I mean, you know, um, um, doing um, uh, a dial on a diabetic, mm -hmm. I mean, anyone can really do right. that as long as you understand what the slide right. scale is. Right, a family member a legally family member right can now can go into that in assisted living right. and do it. Right. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So a family member can do it. Yes. Absolutely. But a nurse couldn't. That's right. Right. Right, even though she's yeah, she really is licensed, and yeah, right, it's right. crazy. And also, the assisted living like also assisted living facilities don't have 
aren't required to have AEDs right now, defibrillators. So really? I'm working on that one, too. Is that part of the common sense? Uh, well, uh, it's. I was going to make it part of it, but then, so. Although they also, if someone falls, cannot actually that's pick right. someone up off the floor. So you can't sort of assess the patient, oh, I just kind of slid out yeah. of bed using an example. They can't, they have to call 911. Oh, that's that's why there's a there's a uh, our our fire chief in Marlboro. That's one of his favorite lines is is uh, we put the assist in assisted living because <laughs> <laughs> because that's, that's their what regularly that's one of the concerns yeah. of the communities. They're constantly being called. You think but about it's the because, expense of that yeah. and and yeah. versus you know I mean a clinician being able to assess clearly that this person has fallen they hit, they've hit their head. We've got to utilize right. emergency services versus right. And then the fire truck shows up. And it's like, yeah. What is right. This right. 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 So. so so that so those are some of our small failures, but I am hopeful that we'll be able to get them done at some point. Um, obviously, our large success was the uh, sort of what you're calling the omnibus Alzheimer's bill. So um, back in uh, the fall of last year, so September or October, we had a joint committee hearing with the Committee on Public Health and the Committee on Elder Affairs, mm -hmm. and we it was by invite only, and we had experts from the field. We had Secretary Bonner, we had uh, medical professionals, we had. Trish Pope from the Marlboro Council on Aging came in and spoke about the yep. dementia-friendly programs that the, the four communities have been working on. And from that, we were able to then take several bills that were kind of floundering in either elder affairs or public health mm -hmm. and put them together in one big bill. Um, I think at the end of the day, there were like 10 or 11 pieces of legislation that were filed individually that we ended up wow. somehow putting into the bill that we passed. Um, so. The bill encompassed, at the end of the day, I think six sections. The first section, the most important section in my opinion, created an advisory council at the state level with stakeholders, as well as tasking them with coming up with a state plan on how to deal with future issues arising mm -hmm. out of well, Alzheimer's great. disease. Forward that's thinking. Great. And that's the great. greatest, um, with the rise in, in incidents we have with folks, and it's not just Alzheimer's, it's also Alzheimer's and related dementia. Sure. We should, every time I say Alzheimer's, it's not just Alzheimer's. Right, right, right. Um, because I did have some people reach out to me and say, well, what about Lewy body well, dementia right, or all these other yeah. things? And they are all encompassed right. within that. Right. Um, so, like, one bill that we didn't get a chance to put in because of some technical issues was covering folks with early onset Alzheimer's mm -hmm. because we're now seeing an increase in people that have Alzheimer's diagnoses from, believe it or not, the early age of 40. Mm -hmm on up and those are people that still should be working and their families still should be working mm -hmm. and it creates all kinds of other issues so that was one of the most important tasks that we have handed to the advisory council to try to figure mm -hmm. out a way to get some support and coverages mm -hmm. coverage for those people um, the second provision that I'm the most proud of is something that we put in to deal with the lack of diagnosis mm -hmm. because we have found that approximately 50 percent of people who are dealing with Alzheimer's or related dementia are unaware of it, whether it's that they haven't been diagnosed and their doctor hasn't told them, mm -hmm. or they have been diagnosed and they don't have the capacity to remember that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they're not <clears throat> taking care of their comorbidities, whether it's heart disease or mm -hmm. diabetes or sure. all these other things, they don't remember to eat. So we really wanted some training for the physicians. And they did hmm. push back with us on yeah. that a little bit. The physicians um, do. They are now required by law to take as part of their continuing medical education to renew their license every two years, a part of their CME continuing medical education in Alzheimer's and dementia diagnosis. Oh, fantastic. Um, they didn't want to do it, but we kind of said, I don't really care and, that and you the, don't want to do it. And their reason was, oh, we got too many things to That's do. That's right. right. And there was another whole organization or a group that said, well, what if I'm, you know, an OBGYN or right. what if I'm not an eye doctor? Right. But the bottom line is, all physicians need to know how to deal with this in one way or another because if you have, even if you're an OBGYN, right. what if you have a pregnant woman whose mother has Alzheimer's and, right. you know, sure. you just need to be able to take all of these things into right. consideration. No, I was going to say the familial impact of, of someone coming in and, and um, 
to sort of just say, well, that doesn't apply to this person that That's I'm looking right. at right in front of me is is at the end of the day naive at best. That is so good. Yeah. I mean, to have the whole profession, yeah. no matter because they're always talking to each other. So to have the somebody right, right. to be able to say, well, you know, I spotted this, right. and, and it might suddenly, not be my area of expertise, yeah, but but I know that there's trouble here. Right. That's right. right. That's right. Absolutely. And it's not just the physicians; it's also the nurses and the nurses' assistants. Right. So I those were as two, part of their as part of their license. That's right. So that's it's great. two of the sections of the bill that I'm really proud of. And you're right, it's the familial impact because Massachusetts as a whole, whether it's the people with the disease or their fam familial caregivers, we're looking at between 500,000 and a million people across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a huge impact, not only on the people as far as their healthcare decisions, but financially. Because caregivers that have to go from working full-time to part-time or part-time yeah. to no time, yeah. right. and especially with the early onset, yeah. Those are folks that are typically working age. Sure. So That's right. So they're falling right out. Now they're on SSD. They're on SSDI. Mm -hmm. They're no longer able. They're no, they're no longer able to. And it, but as you say, it's a family disease. That's now right. all the care, all because right. there's a ton of care involved. That's right. So those caregivers had day jobs, but they don't have anything. That's right. right. And I also think by training all of the uh, medical professional staff, you also sort of start to peel away those the kind of those veils of we just don't talk about it or we don't we don't talk about it because we don't understand it or it's not kind of again my wheelhouse. So I mean, not unlike the conversations we're having around mental health and opioid addiction, etc. I mean, the more we understand it, the more we might. But you know, you know, signs of stress, and you know, are you aware of this resource, or you know, let me connect you with someone. So. Which leads me to the final two sections of the bill, which oh, what a one great well, was wow, that was a tier, right? I knew the rehearsal was worth it. Thank right. goodness. Right. Um, <laughs> we are requiring training of elder protective service workers as well, so that they can spot the signs of abuse of folks that are dealing with these diseases, whether it's familial or whether it's a caregiver mm -hmm. or whether it's someone in the community, yep. because there's financial abuse happening, there's physical abuse happening, and then it's the stress level on the caregiver. I mean, it's it's a really, really tough thing, and the thing is, walk around and you're gonna be lucky if you don't come on somebody who has dealt with this experience, Absolutely. either as a caregiver or as a friend of a care. Everyone sure. in the Commonwealth has been touched right. by this. Right. Right. And everyone hopefully in the Commonwealth will be touched by the provisions of this bill. And then the last provision. Excuse me, just step back, mm -hmm. so Family Protective Service. And who is that exactly? So it's basically we have a 1-800 number in the Commonwealth that the Secretary always talks about, and I should have brought the pamphlet so I could tell folks what the 1-800 number is. I bet that we can get that as a banner on the show. <laughs> I bet that. That I would bet, be great. I bet so our there's in the a 1-800 office number <laughs> that folks can call if they suspect that an elder is being abused, and it can be anyone. Right. And right. the law has changed such that the first thing that the hotline folks will do is then call that elder and try to figure out whether they feel that they're being abused. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, before the law changed, that elder could say no, and then the investigation would close, and that would be it. That is not the case any longer, which is causing a budgetary problem for the, for the folks that provide these services, mm -hmm. like at Bay Path Elder sure. Services. Yeah, right. um, so we're working on that. We're working on getting them some increased funding. But now they have to continue to investigate the case at least a little bit further because the concern would be that the elder says no because either they don't know right. or because they're afraid of whoever is, right. whomever their abuser that's is. Right. And that's I, and right. I think or they're just wondering who the hell, who is this person that's calling me right that's now? That's right. right. What so, is this agency? Am I going to get taken out of my house? That's right. I think that's probably one of the greatest fears Absolutely. around folks who have got dementia is, oh my God, if I get discovered, I'm going to end up in this nursing home bed that's in, right. the, in, in the right. middle of nowhere. And, right. and sometimes the thought might be, sadly, even though I'm not happy with the treatment, it's better than being someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, so I, we will get that number up as a, as a banner. But um, so the, the um, elder abuse hotline is um, staffed by our friends at the various ASAPs, mm -hmm. right? So here in Westboro, that would be Bay Path Elder Services, and other places, it's Elder Services of Worcester, et cetera, right? Right. right. Um, and I think it's important for our audience to know, and you already mentioned it, but there are different types of abuse. Um, and while we won't sort of go into all those, I think it's important that there's abuse we all think of, like it might be verbal or physical, that's pretty obvious of, you know, someone grabbing yep. someone and kind of saying, come over here. And you sort of, those are the ones that unfortunately make headlines and all of that. But there's also um, financial abuse, um, and that could be very subtle uh, and, and in some ways scary because the, there, there are no signs. There's not a bruise or a mark on an arm, but someone could be, you know, liquidating assets at a very slow percolator drip, if you will. Um, so it sounds like you've got we've some... We've also seen increases of that with the growing opioid crisis. Right, it's, absolutely. The oh, impact yeah. on elders has been 
huge I've seen that. in a negative I've seen way. That. I yeah. bet I could give you half a dozen cases yep. with, a ch- with a son or a daughter so, who is living at home often, yep. and next thing you know, they're on the checkbook. Yep. So that right. was another bill that we we're trying huh. to look at establishing a commission on exploring financial abuse of elders and making mandated reporters of banks and things like that mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. when they see that, you know, Mary has been writing checks for the last 10 years to cover yep. the rent, the gas, the electric, the phone, mm-hmm. and the groceries, and then all of a sudden Mary is now writing out a $500 check every month to John, mm-hmm. how do we determine but, whether that's a abuse and give yeah. somebody the power to investigate it. Sure. Now that's really interesting. Yeah. So you make yeah. the banks a reporter. Mm. That's a great idea that's because that, that, cause that's, of course, that's where the finances happen. That's right. And one of the issues that I'll, I'll always tell people when they come in is that, you know, the, the, the issue with financial abuse is typically the people taking the money don't have the money still. Right. right? No, so you can, never, you can never get it you after the never, fact. That's, that's a right. set of players from which when the money's gone, it's gone. Right. So, right. That, so this notion of having a kind of a, a, a strategy really for damages or th- something yeah. forget that's irrelevant right. so the key is to keep it from happening that's right or to, or to right. minimize it right to minimize right. it. Yeah. yeah absolutely now is that the and is that the last section of the bill it's not that was one of the other one, uh, ancillary bills yeah. the last section I of the bill it was my memory and i had forgotten no, no, I had forgot. yeah, just good. making right sure we were arthur if i, I had t- a nickel for every time i heard one of those i forgot jokes during this whole alzheimer's oh, process oh, okay. oh, well i always <laughs> tell people my the wonderfulness about getting old though this is just an advantage right is i never could remember people's names and any of this stuff now i can just say oh i'm old Oh, right? I always Before just said, it was oh, like, I was boy, you're a such a dope. Moment. Oh, yeah, well, you know. So, so last section. So we worked with um, the hospitals, and there was a three-year commission that studied how we implement better practices around Alzheimer's and dementias in acute care settings. In, I see. And as a result of that, the hospitals actually were the first folks on board with this bill, the first provision that we got nailed down to give them three years to create a comprehensive plan on how to deal with folks with Alzheimer's and dementia that are coming into the hospital, either through the ED or through the general intake process. Even if they're not coming in because of the, necessarily because of the dementia, but because of something else. That's right, but largely when someone has a dementia, they're coming in because of the dementia, right. because they've forgotten to take their meds, or because they freak out and they don't know where they are, or because mm-hmm. of something that's happened that's related to their dementia. Right. And often they're treated like they have a mental health issue, or like they're on some kind of a mm-hmm. substance, yeah. or they're just shoved in the corner. Just like the police will tell you. The, one of the things that the police want the training is when they do a police stop, You've got somebody that's who's right. driving, it's got dementia. And they're on the wrong they, side of the road, and you automatically assume you they assume have substance, exactly. and that's not what it is because at all. That's, because that's how they react, too, because they'll be yelling and, that's oh, right. what are you doing, and that's the same right. thing. Right. So yeah. we have given them three years to come up with and implement these plans, and then after the three years goes away, the DPH is then allowed to step in and require that they show the plans and demonstrate that they have the plans in place. So it goes hand in hand with the physician training piece. So it's not just developing the plans, it's actually implementing That's them. right. And and are there checkpoints along the way for the hospital systems? There are not. There are so not. Okay. we kind of okay. gave them a lot of leeway okay. and basically okay. the DPH has the teeth to go in at the end. So if they know there's a hospital having a problem, mm-hmm. they yeah. then have the enforcement authority at the end of the process there's and they can and go what in. what is that enforcement authority? I so mean. they can go in after three years and one day and say where's your plan oh wait you don't have a plan here because there will be you know plans that they can get from other hospitals and help these hospitals that are having trouble implement but i mean are there financial penalties to a hospital to not not. implement that it's more of a they're not right now but dph is the ongoing relicensing authority regarding the hospital that's right right, and i mean obviously again at the end of the three years if we see it being a problem we can always go back i mean i think the reason why i ask about the the financial piece is you know at the federal level obviously with um um, readmissions you know as part of the whole affordable care there were there were those penalties so i just didn't know if there was the same thing okay so I, and, but I, and to me, when you describe that, I think one of the nice things about that is that they're not, they're not mandating a plan. Right. So letting each hospital, so that by the, because kind of by definition, you don't know what you don't know. So it'll be in, it'll be really interesting at the end of those three years to yeah. see what the hospitals have come up with right. in terms of how they want to approach those best this, practices. And now yeah. suddenly you'll be able to develop a, I bet, best pra- practice strategy out of that. That's and really good. also there will be implications of whatever happens with question one in November that will play into mm-hmm. what happens with this plan development. Right. Because obviously either way the financial impact on the hospitals after what happens in November is going to be huge. Will and, and for have, folks that don't know, what is that? Question so one. question one would require a certain high limit on how many patients a nurse in a hospital can serve across the board. At any moment. Right. That's right. right. Oh, to a patient, no, right, a nurse. 
That's staffing right. ratio. That's right. right. Excellent. A All great right. challenge. Yes. That one's a great. We're not talking about that one today. We're not, yeah, we're no, not, no, no, we're we're not. not going to go there. <laughs> I remember being on the board at the hospital, at Marlboro Hospital, and that was kind of came up several years ago. Well, we did independently, legislatively, uh, three years ago, I think, put in a ratio for ICU patients. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we legislatively handled that, and apparently some folks were not happy with that. And so we're going to see where that goes. Actually, ratio. speaking of people not being happy, but uh, as it relates to the hospitals, and so this is a three-year plan, but as life goes in politics, mm -hmm. as there are changes and potentially new majorities come in, can that plan be pulled back, or is that sort of stamped and mandated? How does that sort of practically work? I mean, I think we would just rather, I think that along with the advisory council and the state plan, I think those plans that the hospitals might be allowed to have can fluctuate as long as there is a plan. Okay. I would love them to be able to make changes to it because yeah. they can make changes that benefit people as they, they can't, see fit. They can't, I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is if, if a new majority comes in to, at the state level, can they say, oh, that we're going to Oh, yeah, that's always there. possible. That is, you know, okay. so they our only that. legislation in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that's absolute is our Constitution, and that's not really even absolute because it can be amended. Right. Okay. It's a... So, okay. it could so, process, that, but so that is, everything but is someone would have yeah. to sort of take that up as an initiative. And, That's right. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So, so in the course of all of this, you've obviously learned a lot <laughs> about this notion of dementia-friendly communities and yes. kind of what that kind of community is and what the components are to it. Right. So, and I know kind of early on, one of, one of the things that Shelby was asking was, was based on all of kind of the things you've learned, what do you think? Where do you think things should? Where do you think things should be going? You know, given the fact that there are always financial, there are a ton of constraints. That's right. But, but in so, terms of your kind of your knowledge now, as opposed to two years ago, going, oh, going, oh my God, right. now you really can, right. are in a position to say, oh, th this is this is where the dream it really should be going here. So I first commend the towns of Northborough, Westboro, Hudson, and the city of Marlboro on their work on dementia-friendly communities. I think it's been groundbreaking, and the thing that I'm most proud of of all of that is you've heard me speak to mm -hmm. the training of the students at Assabet yeah. and making sure that our kids at our tech schools not just the CNA students, right. but the students in the auto body and the students at the Epicurean room are all trained. Right, on first, first in the state. That's a wonderful, amazing, amazing program. It's an amazing program, and I should have mentioned at the beginning that our Alzheimer's bill is a first in the nation bill. So I've already been getting calls from around the country about how they can implement what we're doing. So the dementia-friendly programs are fantastic, and that was one of the first things I was taught about as I came into Elder Affairs. And then almost immediately thereafter, I was invited to a Tufts Health Plan Foundation day-long event on age-friendly communities. Mm -hmm. So it expands the scope and doesn't necessarily just focus on dementia-friendly communities, but obviously folks with dementia or, or Alzheimer's would be included and encompassed within that. Um, this can include, but is not limited to things like having an over 55, like is gonna go in at the old Westboro State mm -hmm. Hospital yep. and having directly adjacent a CVS, a grocery store, a target or whatever mm -hmm. uh, some kind of recreational yep. facility but having no sidewalk within the community so that the residents can get from their residence to that facility and having to bus people an eighth of a mile when they could very well be walking which is actually good for them anyway. Sure. Right. Sure. Um, so we're talking about those things as far as age-friendly goes because we've lived in siloed ways for so long that we build these new communities and we think, oh, this is great, right. and then we don't realize until after everything's built and the ground's already broken and the ribbon's already been cut that, in fact, it could have been so much better sure. if we had just planned it correctly from the right. beginning. Right, and of course the private sector isn't going to solve that for you because they're they're thinking about the marketing of their Her one unit. thing. Right. You know, if I'm if I'm in the assisted if I'm in the the senior housing construction business. I'm not in the drugstore business. Right. I'm not in the other. So the, so That's a is, prime example. We already have right. actually right here in Westboro with the Willows, the folks in the assisted living facility over there, try getting them across the street right. to Tatnik yeah. or to any of the stores that That's are right, right there it's at a, their disposal. It's a high without, fatality rate. Right, 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 right. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. I mean, right. hindsight being 2020, yeah. we could have done something better. Right to make that more right. livable for those folks. But that's, you know, I think it's important that we're all having those conversations because now planning boards mm -hmm. can, can reference, you know, kind of what state level work is being done. And, and if you're uh, building a home, I mean, again, you're kind of concerned, uh, you're building a development, I should say, you're concerned about that kind of per unit cost and how yeah. do I make my money back? I mean, that's real. 
But if everyone sort of is sort of universally understanding the issues, then, you know, you really can create win-wins because that's going to, I mean, if I'm Pulte, who is the, the builder of the state hospital project, mm -hmm. um, you know, I want people to continue to move in there because right. ultimately people are going to age out, or right? So right. Um, That's right. That's right, and you, and if you're Westboro, you you know you've got some, you've done something like what you did downtown yep. with the old factory site mm -hmm. that has really been, it, it, given what you were trying to achieve, you yep. did that, you yep. know. But now yep. we're, we're kind of looking at something different that you can try to achieve, right. and if you're doing it from that higher level, that's right. That's great. That's really exciting. Yeah. That's really right. exciting. So Danielle, that was really <laughs> great. This is wonderful <laughs> that, you. that you thought to invite. Thank you very much. You know, it's wonderful. She's and great. Thank you. Just terrific, and to Thanks give a lot me. of folks here a sense yeah. of kind of what's going on there. Thank you very much, Shelby. Thank you for all your work at the... Also, yeah. maybe we can put a banner of our contact information that Absolutely. we want in case anyone wants to get a hold of us. Absolutely. Great. Thanks Great. again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month in the next installment of Frank and Mary in Westboro. Thank you. Thank you.